Jesus, you're the son of David. He confessed that Jesus was Lord. And, Je and the more that his faith was under fire, you keep begging. You're nobody. You don't have a job. You don't have any money. You're, you're in a strange place. But miracles that I tell you will show up in some strange places. We're going to continue there. I'm continuing our series of lessons on miracles. I know that people have a lot of different beliefs about that from ranging from one end to some saying God is not doing any more miracles. That depends on your definition of miracle. I'd like to share mine from the Word of God and, and um, just see where how God can increase our faith. And the reason I'm preaching these is because I know that the devil is attacking us emotionally and spiritually, not just in the physical realm. So my goal is to give us godly biblical information to, con to, combat, to combat what the world is using to affect our minds and the information of the world is causing us to doubt God. And the Bible says my people perish because of a lack of information. You just can't take in all the negative information and not feed yourself the Word of God and then feel like God is helping you. You're not going to feel that way at all. So uh, the world will twist and the world will distort and the world will discredit God. And if we have no answers, we'll find ourselves agreeing with them. My job is to help to accomplish this tonight. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing only comes, faith comes through hearing, and it is only the hearing of the Word of God. That is what is going to give you faith, all right? This is lesson number two, miracles in strange places. Lesson number two, miracles in strange places. The series that I'm preaching that God will increase our faith, encourage us. And for this lesson number two, I want us to focus on this subject. When my faith is under fire. When my faith is under fire. Under fire simply means when it's under attack. It's being attacked in every way under fire. But I'm trying my best in the midst of this pandemic, which is making me in the flesh, yes, question, God, where are you? What are you going to do? And then I listen to everybody else talk about what they need to do. But we want to do what God wants us to do. St. Luke chapter 18, here's a good example of, of another miracle. Last week it was the, the axe handle. Here. And beginning in verse 35, it came to pass that when he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And he hearing the multitude passing by, he heard the crowd. He asked, what's going on? What does this mean? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And his faith was immediately under fire. They which went before or who were in the crowd rebuked him that he should hold his peace. How did he respond to that fire? He cried out even louder, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near him, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I'm in a strange place. I'm in a place where you didn't intend for me to be because when you made man and before man sinned, there was no sickness, there was no blindness, there was, Lord, I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a place of poverty, I'm in a, I'm in a bad place. And so here's, here's the reason, Lord, I just want to receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, receive your sight, your faith, watch this, this miracle was for a reason. And this is what I'm going to continue to, to teach tonight. I'll use more examples this week than I did last, as I did last week. Just more examples. There's a miracle, but this is what Jesus said. It's attached to your faith. 
and your faith has saved you. And immediately he received his sight. And he, here it is, he followed Jesus. Here's the result of a miracle. God is not just giving me a new car so I can ride around and say how nice it is and a new house. That's just miracles in the natural. But there are other things God will do in the supernatural and he's not doing it for us. He wants, he's only doing it for us out of love and because he wants us to follow him. So this man got healed, got faith, followed him, glorified God, God, and all the people. When they saw it, the people gave praise unto God. Thank God for his word tonight. Amen. Tonight I want to continue giving information on why we have to depend, especially now. I'm looking for God to intervene, not just in this situation worldwide, but many of you and many of us, we're going through different kinds of struggles with this pandemic. And there's not too much that's lifting us or picking us up or helping us. We need an intervention of God. Courage, my soul. So I want to continue giving information on miracles and why we cannot limit God. We cannot in any way limit God. Tonight, I want to continue to show that miracles in the Bible, Old and New Testament, if you agree that they are extended and miracles still happen today, I want to explain that it's a sign. It's a sign. It's an encouragement. It's a need being met. It's God showing us. I want to use it tonight by looking at what we call natural laws. That's information I want to give or a general summation of how disinformation about God is floating around. We say God is bound to natural laws. And I want to explain that and show you that God is not bound to natural laws. And so just go with me and at the end, if you agree, fine. And if you say, I don't agree, but at least get the information so you'll know why we believe this way. I want to trace quickly the four periods in the Old and New Testaments, or five periods rather, in the Old and New Testament of miracles. And then I want to end with a story in the Vel text and just pray some scriptures with you. We want to medica- meditate on this. We want to meditate on this all week. With God, all things are possible. I want you to meditate on that all week. With God, all things are possible. So first, I want to give my premise, as I always do. I give a premise in three points, and I try to make let you see and be a guide to what we're saying about it, so that you'll have it to reflect on. And by the way, um, all of my note my notes are available online, and they're free of charge. Amen. Uh, All you have to do is uh, uh, email us, or all you have to do is go online and say, "I need the notes from Pastor Study, so I can do some studying in my own time." Is that all right? So you can do that and um, get, get uh, to us. So I want to look at that and look at what I want to highlight. Here's a premise. Here's a premise. God may change his methods of manifestation, but not who he is. Therefore, I can still believe in miracles. Now, hear it again. Hear it one more time. God may change his methods of manifestation. Remember the Bible says in old times I spoke through prophets and, and then I spoke through son Jesus Christ and these days I'm speaking through my word. But it didn't change who he is. And because he doesn't change, I can still believe in miracles. Praise God. Now, Three takeaways from this that I want, we'll focus on and I want to lift up. God as sovereign, or because he is sovereign, God as sovereign, sovereign rather, and omnipotent and unchanging, he is not bound by natural laws or intellectual reasoning 
who reason against what he can do. Well, my mind doesn't say that God can do this, and so I don't believe that he can do this here. I mean, in my way of thinking, see, it's not strange to God. It's just strange to us. Right? It's not strange to God. We say, oh, it's a miracle. It's not a miracle to God. God's used to doing what he's always done. And so we, 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 we want to take a look at, we want to take, we want to take a look at that. Omnipotent and unchanging, he is not bound by natural laws. He's not bound by our intellectual thinking our, uh, and our reasoning about what he can't do. The second thing I want to talk about is this. God will show up in some strange situations. Remember Sunday we, we, we talked about Psalm 137 on the heart, on the we hung our harps on the willows, and they asked us to sing the Lord's song, and we said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I just want you to know before this is over that God will show up in some strange situations. And I want to explain strange and move from there. The third thing I want to say is limited human doubt cannot impact my faith in God's miraculous. Let me say it again and tell you why I'm, I'm really saying the same thing different ways because I want you to get this. Limited human doubt, no matter whose side it's on, even when I'm having doubts myself, it cannot impact in my spirit and the Holy Spirit that's in me. It cannot make me doubt my faith in God's miraculous. Amen. Okay. Limited. Limited. Let's quickly um, review from last week, just four minutes of review and move on as I build more on that lesson. We were reminded last week that miracles in the Bible are connected to revelations about Jesus Christ. Miracles in the Bible are pointing to revelations of Jesus Christ. It's pointing to God's plan of salvation. It is pointing to something that deals with God. It does not end with us. We are included, but it's not about us. It's not about us. So we, 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 want, we, 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 we found out that uh, it, is, it is God's plan of salvation, and we are meant, God intends for us in our testimony, in our witness, to lift him up. Because a lot of times we lift up the blessing and we ignore the blesser. And God says that, that, that wasn't the reason for miracles then, and it's not why I move for you now. A miracle, in short, as C.S. Lewis, the British theologian, said, it is an interference with nature by supernatural powers. And we found out last week that Satan also has powers, and we want to make sure that it's God's divine power. You do know that Satan can bless you too. You do know that Satan can give you things too to make you think you're doing well. So that you take your eyes off of Jesus and you say, I'm doing well. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not praying that much, but I'm doing all right. I don't go to church that much, but look, I'm doing all right. God must be pleased. No, the devil has supernatural powers too, and the devil knows how to bless you as well. That's why the Bible says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Right? You got that? D don't worry about them. You, got to, you have to know when God is blessing you. There are four words that I want to um, use, and I want you to just write it down. Um, four words in the Bible, especially as we get into the New Testament and uh, the Greek, I always use that. It's there in front of you so that you can understand that every time you see miracle in the Bible, it doesn't mean the same thing. It doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, there is the word teres, T-E-R-A-S, which means wonder, a wonder. Something that, I mean, we used to say God, God is about to blow your imagination. There is the other word, Simeon, which means a miracle that is a sign of something. A sign pointing to something specifically so. Jesus was a man of signs and wonders. Then there's dynamis that comes from the word dunamis which means power. So it's miracle as power, get it, power to get something done. A good way that I define power is like this. Power is simply the resources to achieve the assignment. 
So God says, this is what I have for you to do. I'm going, I'm going to supply those resources. If God says that we are to be a people who are on fire for him and anointed and love him and serve him, he's already given us the resources to do that. He's given us the word. He's given us people around us who praise God. That's power. Dunamis. Then there's ergon. Ergon means works. So there's power. There were miracles through the work. You see it through the work of someone as God is working out something or working on something. Let me read it to you again this week where, th where these three words are found. Acts 2.22. We find these words in one verse speaking about Jesus. He's a man approved by God um, among you by miracles. That's dynamis. Or dynamisi is a form of speech there. A man of signs, Terrace. A man of Simeon, wonders. Jesus worked and performed miracles so that his unbelievers would know that he is the Son of God. That was what that, that he, he, he did it and said, I'm doing this for those of you who can see and who want to know who I am. I am the Son of God. He performed those miracles so that even in the miracles that Jesus performed, they demonstrated in, in these ways, I'm, I am revealing who I am or I'm showing you who God is. I am actually glorifying God by giving you a picture of who God is. So when I heal the sick, that's letting you know that God is concerned about the sick. When you see me feed the 5,000, that's not just to feed 5,000. That's to let people know God cares about them where they are. And this miracle helps them to understand it. When I raised Lazarus from the dead, it wasn't just some circus show. I was letting you know that the God that I serve and the God that I am, we have power over death. And that's because because of God's plan of salvation. So let's go further and let, let's, um, let's elaborate um, on this. God's purpose for miracles. I want to look at just five different ways God did it. Five times or periods in the Bible that miracles were outlined by what God did and when he did it. So to each, uh, uh, I want to make this easy um, because uh, I want us to, to walk away from here knowing that God's about to do something for me. Now, number one, number one, the first, the first time in terms of, of what I want to discuss, the first time period, was in the time of Moses and in the time of Joshua. At the time period when miracles began to happen. In that time period of Moses and Joshua, remember, why did, God, why did God perform some of the miracles that he did with Moses and Joshua? Why that time period? Remember, Moses was reared in Pharaoh's house, right? And he was brought up uh, as, one of the, as one of Pharaoh's own. Everybody thought he, he's in Pharaoh's family. But he, they didn't know he was really one of them. He was a Hebrew. And so they're thinking, okay, Moses is, is, Moses is a Hebrew, those who, who may have known. But they said, wait a minute, he's not like us. He's raised in Pharaoh's house, and Pharaoh is our slave master. And then the Lord goes and says to Moses, I want you to go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And I want you to tell the children of Israel, I'm on your side. Can you imagine how they felt? They were, they were skeptical. They were cynical. How is this man who's whose house out of which he was reared, how is it that he is speaking for God? So God said, I'll show you how. I'm going to use signs and miracles. And these signs will let you know that he is authentic and that I am with him. So you remember when Moses called out the plagues in the Bible? He went to Pharaoh and said there'll be one plague after another after another. And what did God do? God brought it to pass. And the people began to say, wait a minute, maybe he really does know. Maybe he really is standing for God. When he got them by the Red Sea and they started complaining and murmuring and saying Moses can't be all that, God can't be with him, there was another miracle pointing to the fact that God was in Moses, using Moses to help help his people to get through and to be free from slavery. So what happened? Moses opens up, Moses, Moses stretches out the rod, and God opens up the Red Sea, and the children of Israel are like, wait a minute, maybe God really is with him. That's the, that was a miracle for them. 
to encourage their faith and for them to know that God was not letting them down. And after Moses died, Joshua took over. And you, the, most, the one you probably, and I do, I remember the most, is that God said, okay, Moses, and Joshua chapter 1, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, you, Joshua, arise. Go over, Jordan. Go over this place and go over to the promised land and every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I've given you. So now they're following him. But they get to Jericho and the wall is big. And God says, wait, they're, they're like, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? And God said, don't worry, I'm going to speak to my man. I'm going to speak to Joshua. And God speaks to Joshua. He says, here's what I want you to do. Walk to people down there six days. Let them walk around the wall one time. And then on the seventh day, on the seventh day, have them walk around seven times. We used to sing a song when I, when I was growing up, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Joshua did not fight one thing. All he did was to obey God and God worked the miracle. He said, when you walk around the wall, here's when the miracle will happen. I need you, I need you to help me and God needs you to help him to get through, to get you through. He needs you to help him to move on your behalf. He says, all you all have to do is stand there and shout, shout, not dance, yell, yell. And when the noise comes up to me, I'm going to bring the wall down. That was for Joshua. That was in his time. And then the days of Daniel. The days of Daniel, you are the days of, um, oh, before I get to Daniel, let me go to Elijah and Elisha. We preached about Elisha last week in the days of Elijah and Elisha. You remember, we talked about the axe handle uh, floating last week. Um, but, but both of these were prophets to Israel in a time when Israel had begun to compromise. Let me see if you get the connection with these, right? There's Moses, there's Joshua, they're performing miracles, and it's all about God. It's all about God using people. It's all about pointing to him as being the one with the victory. Now, here's Elijah and Elisha. Here's their days now, their time period, right? And during that time period, Jezebel's wife of the king, who, who uh, was trying to destroy the faith of Israel in the one true God, their faith was under fire. And they began to compromise and they began to give up on their faith. They began to serve other gods. So God used miracles through these two men for one reason, to remind Israel as well as the unbelievers that there was only one true God. Remember Elijah took him up on Mount Carmel. He took the false prophets up there and he, and he, and he said, you build your altar, I build my altar. Then he looked at Israel. He said, you know what y'all need to do? You, you need to choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. You're trying to serve Baal and you're trying to serve God, but there is no Baal. And so once and for all, God's going to work a miracle and that miracle should convict you. It should move you back in line. And remember, Elijah, Elijah wrote, the, first of all, the, the prophets, they dance around, they pray, they dance, and Noah. And, and, and Elijah said, by the way, the God who sends fire from heaven to receive his offering on your altar or my altar, that's who God is. So 800 prophets, 450 of Baal and about 400 of, of, of Asherah, Asherah, there they are. They are dancing, they're screaming, they're, then they start cutting themselves because God didn't, their God didn't come. They're cutting themselves, they're bloody, they're screaming. And then after it was over, uh, uh, he said, you know what, let me, let me just uh, call Father, <laughs> God, in the name of, you know, the name of Jehovah, who you are is the only God. The Bible says before he got finished, the, the skies opened up and God sent fire from heaven. A miracle but for one reason, don't forget the reason. It was for what? It was not for gain, but because the revelation of God needed to be manifested. Okay, let's talk about Daniel and, and the three Hebrew boys. The Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, that's another time period. Judah was in captivity in Babylon believing that God had been defeated and had abandoned them or did not exist. And when Daniel interpreted, uh, when, he, he, when Daniel went up and God used him, God said, you know what? They need to see that I'm God, not Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. When he had this dream, they, they said, you know what? You need to call on God's man. Daniel can answer this. And so Nebuchadnezzar thinking he's all powerful. And the, and the Babylonians are now convincing Judah, come on, your God is dead. Your God died in, in, the, in the Jerusalem temple. And now, here they are, here they are wondering and they're standing between two opinions. And here, Daniel goes and interprets the dream and says, O king, 
God's about to bring you down. He, and what he said became the miracle because the next dream, the king has another dream and says, he says in that statue, I saw five different kingdoms. But then he says, but in this dream, because by the way, he said to everybody, I am Nebuchadnezzar. Look at what I built. Look at what I've done. He had another dream. He had to call on Daniel again. Daniel went in and interpreted the dream and said, your kingdom will be taken from you. It happened. Then next comes Belshazzar. And Belshazzar, the people, he's got the people, they're believing that there is no God. They're believing that their God, the God of Judah, the God of Israel, the God who had a promise over their lives, they're believing he's let them down or they're believing that Baal conquered their God. And while Belshazzar was there drinking and having a big party and even desecrated the vessels that were to be used for God's purpose only. Let me tell you something. When God blesses you, you don't desecrate his blessing. And so here's Daniel. Here, 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 here's, here's Daniel and Belshazzar. He's having a party. In the, and Judah, they see it too because some of, many of them were servants serving the 1,000 lords. And they said, wait a minute. They just brought in the cup that we use in the temple they just brought in the pan that we used to sprinkle the blood on the altar. They've desecrated our God. That means our God is gone. And just as they did it, a hand appeared. What a miracle. Remember what I said about miracles. A hand appeared writing on a wall. And that was the miracle that convinced Judah. God brought Belshazzar down. The ministry of Jesus, the fourth way. To show Jesus came to show that he was the word made flesh. He was God in the flesh. Jesus came to point to the kingdom of God to lead those who are following, to lead them to the grace of God. And so he healed with a divine message. As a matter of fact, if you remember in Mark chapter 2, here's the divine message. In Mark chapter 2, a miracle worked by Jesus, okay? Mark chapter 2, they come in. And they bring this man to Jesus who was paralyzed. And everybody was pressing in. The whole crowd was pressing, trying to get to see Jesus. And they couldn't get in the yard. They couldn't get near the window. They couldn't get anywhere to have an audience. So they were so desperate for God to see this paralyzed man that they went up on the roof and they cut a hole in the roof. And here's Jesus preaching, right? In the middle of his preaching, he looks up and sees this man being lowered down. He knew that man was desperate for a miracle something to go against the law that had caused parts of his body to die. So when Jesus healed him, he didn't just heal him. He healed him and gave him new spiritual life. And that was a sign to us that God's miracles point us again to God's eternal plan for eternal life. And that though we were dead, yet shall we live again. The last and final one, after Jesus ascended to heaven, he said to his disciples, as the Father hath sent me, so send I you. The same things that I've done, I'm going to give you power to do it because there will still be those who will need to be pointed to something beyond you. And you will need to do something to show them that even though Jesus is gone, we are legitimate preachers of the gospel. And so he says, I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you power Miracle working power, but it's not about you. So don't you dare go and, and open up a church and charge people to come in and have a miracle. You see, the reason people don't want to deal with miracles is because so many of us, so many preachers have messed it up. We, we turned it into some kind of show. We've now put it out for sale. I, you you want to be healed? Here's how much it will be. No, it's not the point. It's not to make an individual look like they are so spiritual. It always points to the Lord Jesus Christ. It always point to, points to Christ and him crucified. So he said, disciples, I'm giving you power. You shall work miracles. You shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. And when they do, let them know it is because the Holy Spirit in them is greater than any God they were serving. Did you get the commonality in all five periods that we just outlined? Not one time was the miracle done just for a person. It was done to show 
it was done so, I'll put it this way, it let the person know that man who was healed, that, that paralyzed man, and God put life in his body and he got up. It, for him, it was God cared about me. God loves me. And Jesus manifested God. So when Jesus says, there's only one God, he knows something about that God. God must care for me. God has power to take care. God has power to heal me. That's what the miracles were for. Now, here's a point I want you to take home with you. And um, remember the takeaway that we said, the first takeaway, God is not bound by a natural law or anything else in this world. Nothing. Amen? So here's a point to simplify that. Here's a point, one I want you to take with you. Take your limits off of God. Stop limiting God. You're li we, we, we have a tendency to limit God because of what our minds cannot imagine. Well, if it, well I don't know how God's going to do this. I don't believe God's going to do this. I can't see how it's going to. You don't have to see anything. Ephesians 3.20, I pray this into your spirits, and I pray this into your house today. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. Stop limiting God. Stop saying what God can't do. Let God do what God's going to do. All that we ask or think according to the power that is working in us, according to the power of the Holy Spirit that is working in us, God is able to do just that. Hallelujah. Thank God. Natural law. Let me just, I, I, I'm not going to do a whole lot of justice to this. I don't have for the sake of time, but I think you'll get it on just to, the way I'm going to put this. It is not doing justice at all. This can take a whole lot of little thing, a whole lot of teaching on this, but let me see if I can do it this way because people are saying what God is bound by. Well, because it doesn't work like this. Well, because that's not what was designed to work. So God, God stuck by that. In four minutes, let me, let me, let me uh, take a shot at it, Okay. Natural law. Let me give one. Einstein's uh, theory of gravi uh, gravitation. What goes up must come down. Before I give you this, I want to ask you this question again. Do you believe in God? Do you believe that God is sovereign? I've read to you last week. He's not answerable to anyone. He can do whatever he wants to do that is within his nature to do. And he, he does not have to consult us about it at all. He's, do you believe he is omnipotent? He has all power. All power. If you believe that, now if you don't believe any of those things, I can't talk to you about miracles. If you think that God is no bigger than you, and because you can't do it or imagine it, God can't, then you have reduced God to the size of your faith rather than growing into the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Laws of nature are just, here's what the law of nature is. When they say what goes up must come down, where, where do they get it? Something they can't see, they call it gravi you know, gravitation, that's what they called it. Okay, what goes up must come down. The law simply describes what the scientific observer has seen, and he's trying to put it in language, Okay? The law is not the power. What goes up must come down. The law is not the power. The law of nature are man's observations of how something acts or cannot act. Do you agree with me on that? Let's, let's stick with this law, okay? The law of gravitation simply explains how it works. And that's according to scientific observation. The law is not the power. They, the law rules nothing. The law did not create gravitation. The law explains how it works according to the observer. According to the thing that is discussed. So that laws can produce, cannot produce anything. And to think that a law can produce something is like thinking you can make real money 
just by knowing the law of addition or arithmetic or multiplication or math, right? I know the law. The law says $5 plus $5 is $10. That's the law of it. But you can't produce real money based on the law, the scientific observance of something and what someone has said it is supposed to do. Hear me again. The laws of nature, scientific laws, theories cannot produce anything. The laws of nature, like the laws of, 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 of gravitation or gravitivity, watch this. Those laws only explain or describe something, how nature behaves. But now listen to this. If you introduce an interference to the law or if you introduce an intervention, something intervenes into that law, it can alter it or, or, or manipulate its behavior. Scientists do it all the time. They want to tell me science and God are not antithetical to each other. Please stay with me because I, I know, but I want you to get this. Science manipulates the laws of nature daily. Right? Daily. They say, well, what comes up must, what goes up must come down. And then they said, let's, they invented the airplane. And when they invented the airplane, they found a way to send something up. Yeah, right? Send it up. They manipulated the law. Science manipulated the law through their limited intellectual reasoning capacity and said, we're going to send a plane up that will go a whole day without having to come back down. Now, they can do that. And then they look at, at, at Acts when Jesus was standing there talking to his disciples. And Jesus said, I got to leave you. I got to go back home. Go to the upper room and stay there until you and dude with power from on high. Right? They laugh at us. Right? Because Jesus stood there. And the Bible says while he was standing there, the Holy Spirit, no backpack, no airplane, no jet pack. He just went up. And when he went up, the disciples were standing there like this. What in the world? And the angel came and said to them, why are you standing here gazing into the heavens? The same way, the same power, the same miracle working power that took Jesus up is bringing him back again. Science can manipulate the law of nature themselves and change it and intervene. Why? Last week we talked about an axe handle falling into the water. The weight of the axe handle, the st or, or the axe head rather, and the axe head that was still floated directly to the bottom of the water and people will stand back and say, well, that can't happen. I ain't nowhere in the world that you can take an axe head or you can take a block of cement and you can put it in the water and it can float. But let me tell you what man did. Man manipulated that so that now they have created a cruise ship that's the size of a hotel. What did they do? They intervened into the law of nature to get something out of it that will benefit them so they created a, a, a cruise ship that's the size of a hotel plus some more and it just floats on the water. They manipulated that. They made something happen. All right, now, now watch me. Watch, 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 watch this. Get this again. They interfered with the law of nature to benefit them. Thousands of man's inventions violated the law of nature. Well, let me tell you what happens with my miracle. There's the God factor. God says, I'm not bound by this law. I'm going to find a, I can find a way to get around this law because I created the thing that the law was made about. The thing that they studied to come up with the law, I made it. Therefore, I can intervene and bring something out of something that should not have come, should not have happened, could not have happened. But because I'm God, I don't want you limited to what you see. Don't be limited to what you see on CNN. Don't be limited to what people tell you this can't happen, that can't happen. When God gets ready, God will intervene into the natural law about something that he, in order to bless somebody that he cares about. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Stop letting people tell you what God can't do. Man manipulates 
violates the law. And if man can manipulate the law, the one who made it can come out and know. Yes, he can open up a Red Sea. Yes, he can go into a fiery furnace and take the heat out of the flame, even though the law of the fire says fire will produce heat. And this is how you can produce heat. God manipulated. God conquered. God overcame it. It's not impossible for me to understand that if man can manipulate laws and they can create things, we can put a man on the moon. We can now send somebody and they can live out in space for months at a time. Don't you tell me that God can't manipulate and do what God wants to do when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, because God is sovereign. I'm still expecting a miracle. Point two, get this. God, you got to say this to yourself because this is where we are today. God, I'm in a strange place. Show up for me. Uh, okay, and then God says, wait a minute. Even before I show up for you, but particularly when I show up for you, who's going to get the credit? Your miracle includes you. It's not about you. It blesses you because God loves you. I told you last week, a miracle is a miracle. What is a miracle to me may not be a miracle to you, but when I need God to intervene and change the situation and nothing else can do it, but God, I'm sorry. You can call it what you want. To me, that's my miracle. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, uh, that, that, that's my miracle, right? That's my miracle. And I'm taking that as my sign that God does hear and answer prayer. So can I tell you again, don't ever let scientists tell you what God can't do based on this and based on my observation of this and my observation for that. God is omnipotent. God, I'm in a strange place. Let's, let's close with the text now. St. Luke 18, a man by the name of Bartimaeus was blind, and because of that, he had no choice but to beg. Hear it again. The man was blind, and because he was blind, he had no choice but to to beg. He was begging. He could not do anything for himself. He, he had no choice but to beg. But he could hear. The man had no trouble hearing. So he hears in the text all these people. They're, they're, they're running. They're moving. And there's a whole lot of them. He can hear. And he screams out, what's going on? What's happening? Where are all these people going? Is there some danger? Do y'all need to get me up and out of here? Get me out of the way? And they looked at him and somebody said, Jesus of Nazareth, it's passing by. Now, obviously, he knew something about Jesus. Somebody had to witness to this blind man about Jesus. What, what, what makes you say that? Jesus is passing by. I got a problem. I'm blind. I've never seen anything. I've never seen a sunrise. I've never seen a sunset. I've never seen my mother's face. I've never seen my own face. All I can do is beg. I'm in a strange place. It's unique to most people. Here I am. I want to be a grown man. I want to go out and make a living for myself. I don't want to be here begging, but I got a problem that does it. I'm blind. I'm dependent on the mercies of people. I want someday to see what my family looks like. I've never seen before. I've never seen lightning flash across the sky. And he heard Jesus was coming and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Whoa. Jesus, his faith, at that point, his faith was under fire. Because the crowd began to tell him, stop screaming, shut up. Stop screaming. He didn't care about you. His faith was under fire. He knew that Jesus was the son of God because he called him son of David. And the term son of David is the messianic term or the term used only for the Messiah in Jewish history and in Jewish teaching. The son of David referred back to the one that Jesus said, that God said, this one who is coming 
from the seed of David is going to occupy the throne forever. He's going to occupy the throne in the kingdom of God. He heard that somewhere. He didn't just call him Jesus anybody. There were a lot of people with the name Jesus in the, in the New Testament. There was a whole lot of people. I don't know if it would have dared be Jesus Johnson, Jesus Jones, Jesus Muse. A whole lot of people had the name Johnson. But he knew just which one it was. Jesus, you're the son of David. He confessed that Jesus was Lord. And, G and the more that his faith was under fire, you keep begging. You're nobody. You don't have a job. You don't have any money. You're, you're in a strange place. But miracles that I tell you will show up in some strange places. Jesus heard him and said, wait a minute. Who is it? Who's calling me? He said, have mercy on me, Lord. Have mercy. Are you holding anything for me? Is there anything you can do for me? And Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do? He said, I just have one thing. The doctors can't help me. Medicine can't help me. I've been blind this way and they've given up on me. Jesus, do you have anything that can help me to receive my sight? You see, Jesus, if I can get my sight back, I can go learn a trade. And if I can learn a trade, I can get a job. And if I can get a job, I can get my independence and my respect back. I want to run home. I want to run home and see what my cousins and my family and my aunts and uncles look like for real. I, 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 I might even see the sunset this evening. It was about him, but I'll show you. It, was, it, it included him. But it was really about Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus looked at him and said, here comes mom, here comes the miracle. It's in a strange place. He said, receive your sight. That was the release of a miracle. It may not have been big to you. And it wasn't no hocus pocus. He didn't have a great line and pour oil on him. And, 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 and you know, that's all right. It's okay when God's moving. I don't, I don't make fun of that. But I'm just saying when Jesus has spoken and the man received his sight. Did I tell you that a miracle includes you, but it's not about you. It's what you're going to do with it after you have the miracle. Whatever you're praying to God to do in your life, I need you to pray and ask God to do it in such a way that in the name of Jesus, you promise him you're going to give him the glory. For the Bible says the purpose of the miracle was lived out right there. As soon as a man got his sight. He started praising God. He started glorifying God. And people said that was that man who was blind. Then the people started praising God. God is going to work something out in this day and in this time that in the name of Jesus is going to turn people back to God. Everything else is failing us. Everything else has gone down. But God, I still believe in miracles. I'll see you next Tuesday night. Listen to this. Listen to this. I want to tell you, I decided in the name of Jesus, God will show Show up in some strange places and he showed up to make the impossible possible. God can do anything. Man's limitations cannot help us, but there is power beyond what you can ever think. What do you have to do when your faith is under fire? When your faith is under doubt, even the devil has got, he gets to your mind and tells you you're not worth anything. God doesn't care about you. God does not love you. He'll tell you all kinds of bad things about yourself. What are you going to do when your faith is under fire? Do what that man did. Shout out even louder. Come, Lord Jesus, and start praising him even harder. And I've come to tell you point three, and I'm going home. The unbeliever is blind, but now I see. Can you imagine that man walking around? He didn't know the song. I know that. But had he known it, he, he walked around and said, Have you seen, look at my miracle. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found with blind, but now I see. When you're at your point of desperation and you need a move of God, you need God to intervene into your situation in the name of Jesus. Do what the kids say. The kids, the young people say, turn it up. It's turned up. You got to turn up. Turn, let your praise turn it up. Let your, turn, turn it up. Turn it up. Turn it up. Your faith will help you. Your faith will bring you through. And then every time, every single time, Every time 
Would you, each victory will help you some other to win. Thanks be to God that Jesus showed up in that strange place. And I'm here to tell you today, your miracle is your miracle. What God does for you, he intervenes. He does what you can't do. It may not be the miracle for somebody else, but that's my miracle. Some of you feel like me. My life is a miracle. My life is a miracle. When I look back over my life and I think things over, when I see where I used to be, but I look at to where I am now, I may not be all that I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I'm used to, what I used to be. My eyes have been opened and my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord into my situation, into this pandemic, into my finances, into my job situation. The jobs may have laid you off, but God has not been laid off. My help comes from the lift up your head in your house. Your miracle is about to take place. Lift up your head. The doctor said you're sick. That's okay. Is there a word from the Lord? Yes. You pray and ask God for your miracle. You ask him. You open up. God, every, every law is against me. But thank God. Praise God. When the whole world is against you, if God be for you, who can be against you? I pray that you will have a miracle in doing this, even this pandemic, that God will open up doors. And here's the reason. Don't you dare not give God the praise. Don't you dare pray and ask God to help you. And then you don't tell anybody else that God did this for me. That's the miracle, to give God praise and to give him glory. May you have a blessed week in the name of Jesus. I want to pray for you now. My faith is under fire, but my help comes from God. I don't always need miracles, but every now and then I, I ask him, maybe you're beyond that. I ask God, can you help me? God, I need to see. I need, I need to see. I need it because God loves you because he wants you to be encouraged. There's some things God will do for you when you pray for it. He intervenes and manipulates and moves situations around and, and it happens. You just can't say, look at what I got. Look at my house, look at my car. Look, look at what God did for me. God kept me, I kept eating, eating. Even when I got laid off of my job, I prayed that miracle. I did not go without because God allowed things to happen and I had food on my table. Praise God, hallelujah.